from Collider Studios in the heart of Los Angeles. Do you like Star Wars? Well, you've come to the right spot. This is Collider Jedi Council. I'm Kat Napsok here in Los Angeles. Apparently, I mumbled that one, John, no, because okay. I've had an afternoon whiskey. Kidding, I have not. <laughs> All right, with me, let's get right to it. Roka Fat. Hello. I'm so excited to be back here. I got my dancing Boba shirt on. I'm ready to make it happen. Let's do it. Dancing Boba. <clears throat> Christian Harloff's out today, but the Grand Moff Nemiroth is Very in. Very happy to be here. I don't have a cool shirt to show off, but... It's a Grand Moff kind of day. Yeah. You do have that Grand Moff hat. I love this That's hat. That's okay. And I got my new Star Wars Smuggler Bounty oh, t-shirt yeah. on. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ain't that cute. All right. <laughs> Guys, Aww. let's get into it. We got a lot to talk about. I want to spend a lot of time at the end of the show with fan questions from Twitter and Facebook from our Facebook group, Collider Jedi uh, Council Facebook group. So let's get into Star Wars movie news. This is the news that clicks, the news that moves from all around the galaxy related to the Star Wars movies. Get it? Got it? Good. First one up. I'm so glad we have the Grand Moff Nemiroff here today because she's kind of an Oscar expert around these parts, and I am uh, not. But we have Oscar noms for The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. We actually got to, uh, you know, uh, four categories. Up to four categories, uh, visual effects, original score with the great John Williams, which I believe is his 51st nomination. That it is. I know some things. Sound mixing, sound editing, and then the question of was Mark Hamill snubbed? That's what I want to talk about here today. And as I said, you study these things, Perry. You are so much. smart <laughs> about Oscars. You're giving me a little too much credit, but... I do. I love Oscars. Yeah. I love award season. I love celebrating all the great movies of 2017 and the predictions and the betting, just really everything about it. And when Last Jedi popped up in a bunch of categories, mm -hmm. I was thrilled. I was glad this was getting recognition. And when it comes to the sound mixing and the sound editing categories, that is kind of where I assumed it would yeah. land above any of the other ones. So with the whole Mark Hamill getting s snubbed thing. <laughs> snub. You're putting quotation it, marks well, around that. Well, it depends <laughs> on your definition of a snub. Roka, we've had this conversation. We I've had it with a whole bunch of people just mm -hmm. because, you know, if you go look up on Google the official definition of a snub, it doesn't really give you a good explanation as to how that's applied to the Academy Awards. But I can tell you that when I think of a snub, mm -hmm. I think a movie is snub when it's got a very good chance of getting a nomination in a particular category, right. but then it doesn't, and something else that is more surprising does. That, to me, is a snub. And even though I think Mark Hamill's work in The Last Jedi is exceptional, his right. performance in that Great was stuff. really, really just... I knew he was going to be good in the movie, but it was above and beyond anything I could have expected. He was not... A snub, though, because yeah. I don't think it was in the realm of possibility for him to get that nomination over some other people that might be considered actual right. snubs. And I love your definition of it. The only snub in the Oscar histories that I'm aware of is Jim Carrey for Man on the Moon in 1999. <laughs> All right, so, Roka, uh, yes. let's start with this first, and then we'll talk. We'll give some congratulations to the crew of The okay. Last yes, Jedi yes, to talk yes. about. But let's talk about this idea of Mark Hamill snubbed. We could all agree performance was great, but was yeah. it a snub or just kind of expected? No, I think it was kind of expected, and the reason is because people come out of Last Jedi conflicted about how Ryan Johnson and Mark Hamill, uh, what they did with the Luke Skywalker character. If people would come out of that really loving the arc, really enjoying it in mass, I think there would have been a stronger push to get him nominated. Mark Hamill does incredible work. And remember, he has not done a lot of on-camera work over the last 30 to 40 right. years. It's mostly voiceover stuff. So for him to step up and create such a fantastic character and kind of do a lot of twists here with Luke Skywalker that we haven't seen before in a Star Wars film, I think he mm. deserves definitely a lot of credit for that. But unfortunately, I think people coming out of this weren't 100% happy with what was done with the Luke Skywalker character. And I think that's what kind of stalled the push to get him nominated right. for an Oscar. And I don't think it's a snub personally. Yeah, and, and leading up to the, the award season, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like you were hearing his name around. Right. And, and also, Perry, historically, outside of, say, Return of the King, these type of genre movies, as we saw with Wonder Woman this year, mm -hmm. don't necessarily get recognized by these crusty old voters. It's, <laughs> it's true. And... 
I, I guess I push back on that idea just a little bit because when I do consider some of the, let's say, Star Wars or superhero movies that I mm -hmm. love, but then I look at these categories and who's getting nominated, would I really take one of those movies out to put one of these in? Mm. Are they really not as deserving as some of these superhero movies or Star Wars movies? I'd have a really hard time making that argument, despite how much I love those movies. But, you know, there really is no doubt that they have a much steeper hill to climb to actually get that kind of recognition mm -hmm. versus let's say something that might be assembled as an, an Oscar bait type film mm -hmm. or something sure. that explores subject matter that has true roots or something that could change the course of someone's life and leave them with this lasting impact that might make them look at society a new way, something that's more timely. Right. And I'm not saying that a Star Wars movie can't change someone's life. Because it changed because, my life. <laughs> well, I, look at where we're sitting right now, look right. at everybody watching this sure. show and going to the Luke Skywalker thing. That is one side of the Last Jedi, you know, love it or hate it argument mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I really, I can understand and feel where you right. have an attachment to a certain character and then they do something that is detrimental to that character. I right. get that. So this can change lives, but there's no doubt that there is Oscar bait and then there's blockbuster movies. As it can, yeah, John. And I do want to say this, is, it's not a negative. It got four nominations, which yeah. is great. Uh, Force Awakens got five. Mm -hmm. So this is already higher than any of the prequels got individually per movie. And you're, it's going to be a tall task to match what New Hope did, which was 10 nominations, six victories. So that's a really tall order to match. And that's, that's interesting. You talk about New Hope, and yeah. I guess I should throw that in there with the Return of the King thing, where yeah. it did get a lot of recognition. <laughs> Yep. probably because it was so new and a different time you guys both you know study this a little bit more than i do quite frankly i'm i'm on staff to be the the, the star wars guy yeah so um it's it I, I think it's possible that one day a star wars movie could get nominated because again of what we saw with return of the king but why is it why did return of the king get that kind of campaign behind it get that kind of movement behind it back then mm. it, is that even possible now we like Logan. I know a lot of people really, yeah. but it just does it go, just come down to we need a, a movie where two people stare at each other and their hands <laughs> brush up against each other and <laughs> well, the yeah. music swells. I and think well, we have that. I yeah. lean more on what Logan did, where yeah. and this is one of the reasons why I really do love Logan quite a bit, and mm. it's why I've loved actually actually Force Awakens in a way. It's done something similar, where it's a movie that can be what folks that have been fans of these movies or these characters for years and years want mm. and want to love in a certain way but then it also opens the doors to people who maybe don't know every single detail that came before yeah. it and it could be a really great strong impressive standalone movie because I said this I took my parents to Force Awakens and I'm sure they were not gonna like it because they're not as invested as I am and they wound up loving it yeah. and I had a similar situation with a movie like Logan where mm -hmm. one Logan is also just a super high quality movie, no matter how you look at it, no matter what kind of movie it is, whether it's got Wolverine in it or not, that is a right. great, it's a great family drama slash thriller. And I just love everything they did in that movie. It was one of my favorite movies yeah, of 2017. But I think why it managed to kind of break through a little is because of how it distance its, distances itself from what you would picture as the typical superhero movie, mm, just okay. in the way, in tone, how it's designed, the subject matter. And I think that if Star Wars winds up with a standalone movie, or who knows what Ryan Johnson's trilogy is going to be, right. but something that stands out from what we've had before and stands out in terms of tone, not in the exact way that Logan did it necessarily, but it may, it may be in its own way. Mm -hmm. I think that's its path to actually getting more Oscar nominations. Great yeah, insight. I couldn't agree with that more. I think that I, I was going to say that as well. I think Ryan, this may be the hottest take we can come up with together, Perry, is this idea that Ryan Johnson's switches through this movie may have offended a lot of the Star Wars base, but it may be what's necessary to, in the end, get, this, get mm -hmm. any Star mm -hmm. Wars film considered for best picture since A New Hope, maybe the first one will be in the Ryan Johnson trilogy because his approach to it is completely different. It's more conventional, film-oriented. What he's trying to do is to make it almost irrelevant that it's in space, almost irrelevant that it's a Star Wars movie. It's about the story, like Logan did. It wasn't, it didn't matter that he was a superhero. It was about his journey. And I think Return of the King, that whole, all mm -hmm. those films are a different case because people were loving them from the first one. There was a push, right. a push, a push. And so Return of the King really hit that on the head. Nobody, uh, 
most people like all three movies, so it was a build for this one to be uh, considered. So a little bit of like good work. Here's your one. Yeah, for the here's last your one three. exactly yeah. for all the technical achievement yeah. that you've done. So I, but I think Ryan Johnson, as much as people may hate this, he may be twisting that ship a little bit, but it may in the long run be what this franchise needs to get awards consideration. Ultimately, it also has to be both, I think, critics and fans, and yes. not that critics and fans are right. the people who even vote on the Oscars, but I think when it comes to blockbuster movies, mm. more so than an independent film, you need that momentum and that excitement from both sides that all of a sudden puts this movie on the voting members' right. minds in a new way. Right. Right. I, I think those, that's a great insight from both of you there about it has to go outside of genre, but remain for us in genre. But mm -hmm. for people to take look at it again, I look at like Titanic, which was the event movie mm -hmm. of that year, but was a big technical mm -hmm. achievement and kind of moved things forward in a lot of different ways. So that's partly why it won, not just the Jack and Rose dialogue. Do we think any of these four uh, will uh, be a victory here for Star Wars? I mean, the Holdo thing alone, mixing and editing, right, Perry? Am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> All right, I'm wrong. It's. I mean, it's hard because look at Dunkirk, basically, mm -hmm coming up with more nominations than I ever thought it would have when it first hit theaters. But there's another example. Look at how much money that movie wound up making and how right. much people were talking about it well after its release. You know, it's a Christopher Nolan movie and a good one, so I did expect it to do well to a degree, but not to the extent that it did. And there's no doubt in my mind that that paved the way to as many nominations as it got. So I think that's the one to beat. I think the one big surprise here is... Uh, John Williams getting the nomination for Last Jedi mm. and not The Post, because mm. I would have predicted that John Williams would have walked away from that Oscar nomination announcement yeah. with a nomination, but right. I thought it was going to be for The Post. I mean, I love The Last Jedi score. I think mm -hmm. it's so good. It's, it, it just, it, it, it really, not more than any other Star Wars movie, because that's, I mean, this is some of his best work. Obviously, Star Wars, mm -hmm. his best work over his course of his, course of his career. But Last Jedi, the m music, John, moved yeah. me more than I think I remember in other movies. Absolutely, and I, I don't, but and I agree with you, Ken, it does, and I, I, I think this is a great nomination for John, but I don't think he's gonna win this one. I think Desplat will take this for Shape of Water, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think they're a lock for what was a visual, best visual effects. I think they'll absolutely no. get that, I do. I, okay, the I visual mean, effects in this movie, yeah. they're great. Yeah. One of those apes movies needs to walk away well, with an with Academy that. Needs, Award win. Needs versus will are two different things. I know, and I think I because there wasn't enough of an yeah. audience desire for the apes and there's such a pushback. It's just such a long overdue recognition right. that as much as I right. love some of the visual effects yeah. I saw in this movie, yeah. oh, but please I, don't take that away from that will? one. I like that. <laughs> like, I, I need to stop eating fast food tacos, but will I? No. We'll see. Right. But I will say John will win, I think, in my opinion, for episode nine. I think they'll give it to him as a career one. As a yeah, because it's been since 93 since he's won. So yeah. I think that yeah. when he does nine, I think he may possibly add from the Academy, and I bet every composer nominated will gladly yeah. step aside for John to get the Oscar on that. Kind of like when uh, A-Rod gave up shortstop for Cal Ripken in that All-Star game. <laughs> sure. Is that it? Absolutely that same it? thing. That's for you, Mark Ellis. <laughs> All right, guys, next story here. This is kind of a compilation of a couple stories from one topic. Reed Moreno confirms that she has had conversations with Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy herself. But she then, while speaking and promoting her movie up at Sundance, said she won't be directing a Star Wars movie. That wasn't why she had the meeting. Won't really talk about the meeting. But this is an interesting conversation to dig into interesting news bite because I think we all agree we would love to see a female director in the Star Wars universe on the big screen but we also know we have some television stuff coming out live action mm -hmm. that Disney streaming so Perry first of all get us up to speed on Reed Moreno her career what she's done and how could she fit in this universe? And let's talk about what she might be doing. So the first thing that came to my mind when you brought it up yesterday to yeah. me was the fact that I covered her feature directorial debut, Meadowland, when it came out in Tribeca. I didn't get mm. to talk to her, but I got to talk to Olivia Wilde. And I will say that that's not a movie that I love, mm -hmm. but it's also a very tough movie to watch. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the main reason, the subject matter. It is it's depressing, it's very sad, and it's all about dealing with grief, but yeah. what she does with that movie is something else. When you pair, if you wanna see good work from Olivia Wilde also, you gotta mm. watch that movie. She is just incredible, like, cause you would think that, so, so the story is about she loses, her son dis disappears, vanishes, and it's about the grief of dealing with that, mm. and you would think that someone could maybe, I don't know, tip the scale to, to melodrama and just be wallowing in her sadness the entire time. But the reason that the movie is watchable and not miserable is because 
she she just strikes the right balance between expressing all of that in a really powerful way, but through some subtlety also, mm -hmm. which I really appreciated. And when you pair a performance like that with a director who can capture it the right way, and she most certainly does, it just takes it to a whole nother level. And she has a, a lot of experience as a cinematographer also, and you see it in that film, and I think you see it in pretty much all of her work, because Metal End, she isn't just the director, mm -hmm. she was also the director of photography, and mm -hmm. she was also the camera operator on that, which wow. is something else. And if she brings that on to other films, yeah. there's pretty much no doubt in my mind that anything she makes is gonna look beautiful. But what I like about thinking back to Metal Land is, we're not just gonna end up with a movie that looks beautiful, but she knows how to bring the most out of her cast and out of the story and how to capture it. And then with this meeting here, so mm -hmm. obviously the first thing that would come to my mind, because we've talked about where is our female director for a Star Wars movie? So that's mm -hmm. where my mind went. Mm -hmm. But then you think she directed some of The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. And Handmaid's Tale, oh boy. And I believe she directed the first three episodes. That's and correct, yeah. It is one of the, the rare shows that just sucks you in from the second it starts. <laughs> and the visuals in that show are just through the roof. So considering the success of that show and all the awards recognition it's getting, I would suspect that, you know, they're not just meeting for fun, even though she's sure. denying rumors and stuff. They're they're meeting because Kathleen Kennedy is scouting talent to yeah. recruit. And I would think that the most likely path for a director like Reed Morano is probably going down the TV route. So if that is what they're looking at her for, I am thrilled about You'd it. You'd be happy with that. Roca, weigh in on this. Well, this is interesting. I, I, I know the the the, the uh, immediate things, I think, TV, but I think with Ryan Johnson setting up this trilogy mm -hmm. and this clamor that has been going on about getting a female director on a Star Wars movie, this is very big. I think Reed is a way you can go. I think you're right about Metal Metal is a really tough film to watch, and going through that and seeing what she can do with that, you see that she's capable of directing features and directing TV with these very dark, difficult stories that are complex and layered and have much to say about, so, have a lot of social commentary. So mm. this could totally fit in this new idea of this new trilogy of Ryan Johnson's. I think Kathleen Kennedy is definitely making these moves into this new area. She's like, I, you gave me a, a toy box or a, you know, I played with the toys and I did what I could with it, but I've got these other toys that I want to play with, these other darker stories, these other more complex stories in the Star Wars lore that we could play around with. And I think Reed would be a great, especially if you're going to do, if you're going to even play a one-off with a pre a Leia prequel movie or right. anything like that or you can go into a whole new thing with the new trilogy so I think Reed is a fantastic choice for this to have and of course they're all going to say oh we didn't talk about yeah, Star Wars yeah. that one is about <laughs> because no one wants to get taken out of consideration <laughs> you know so but I think it's a I think it shows that no matter what the uh, uh, the pushback is on Kathleen having issues with some of these directors she is still pushing forward to get new voices and loud voices that are unique and different in the Star Wars universe yeah general meetings are obviously common in this sure. town and and I'm sure that could have been part of it let's just have a conversation but yeah you're right she's not going to be like yeah I'm directing the second <laughs> Brian Johnson exactly. trilogy there um, I want to go focus though on what she might bring to a possible live action television show again this mm. is open speculation this is part of the problem because this story broke like late last week she's in talk so she's meeting and then it's like no nah, it isn't it isn't you know we're not in those meetings but let's just let's just mm -hmm. openly speculate if they're doing a live action TV show I love the idea of Dave Filoni moving over something like that maybe overseeing it with his knowledge of lore and canon and and sense of the force and something big and deep and let's say it goes, you know, everyone's beloved old Republic time period or mm. something like that. Um, what, you know, the idea of someone of this caliber, Perry, bringing, like you said, Handmaid's Tale. This isn't like some sitcom and no disrespect yeah. to anyone out there doing sitcoms. But like this is this this is would be a an HBO quality version of a, mm. of a show, which I guess before I'm always afraid when I hear original live action Star Wars show on a streaming service. Uh, is this is this going to be Babylon 5? Like, what is this, you know? <laughs> well, the HBO darker route is immediately where my mind went, and pretty much just because of the films and the shows that I'm aware of that she right. worked on. I mm -hmm. mean, The Handmaid's Tale is a deep story, yeah. and we just talked about the, the it's emotional... It's not a light romp. <laughs> we, we also talked about the emotional complexity of Meadowland, and yeah. mm. in both instances, I think it is abundantly clear how talented she is at digging into the layers of a specific person and giving you the access to what they're going through and what they're feeling, and when you have someone who is especially good in that respect, you want to be able to bring that to a show, too, and it's, mm. you know, not that Dave Filoni can't do a darker show, mm. but I immediately associate him with Clone Wars and 
and rebels, and right. th that's not necessarily even light or fair. Mm -hmm. I think they're taking that that show into oh, they've yeah, been taking yeah. that show into dark territory. But you know, actually, now that I'm speaking about it out loud, to see their combined mm -hmm. minds come together on a Star Wars series, it might be really nice. And yep. you know, I'm thinking back to something she shot too. I mean, have you ever broke? You've probably seen Frozen River. Oh yeah, with Melissa Leo. Yep. Yeah, I, that was like the first <laughs> time that I ever looked. At at one of one of the things that she worked on and said oh like who shot that and actually flagged her name because she right. shot that and that is visually chilling and mm -hmm. chilling is the perfect word to use for a movie like that yeah. but seeing her sensibilities in just like the emotional complexity of a character she's dealing with and especially paired with dave filoni's vast knowledge of mm -hmm. the franchise and how how you can structure a powerful series I think that could be a good combination, and I just hope that they go, you know, the darker, I guess, more adult route for something like that if it's going to be live action. Yeah, if you're going to pay extra, John, you're going to take some more of my Netflix money and put it to your Disney streaming service. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's time to, I don't want uh, a droid adventure. I want something dark, maybe mm -hmm. not, dark, we always use that term, but yeah. like exploring the themes of the Force and Sith and light and dark and yeah. all that stuff. When we see with Reed's work, you know, females are the protagonist of the stuff that she works on. And so this is a, a positive thing. You know, you don't, I'm not trying to uh, put her in a box. I'm saying this is a, this is what they call what do they call this is a growing business this is a growing idea people mm. want this in that you know tessa thompson talking about having an all-female uh, avengers movie black widow movie might be a team-up movie so we see this coming with birds of prey and gotham city siren so there is a push within all these franchises to have more female-centric movies why wouldn't she do a female rebels all female rebels series where they're mm. exploring what it's like to be a rebel in this there weren't a lot of there were no mm -hmm. female pilots in the original trilogy that we see there's one cut out cut, yeah. Jedi, but we see more female pilots in Rogue One. We see more in Force in, For in Force Awakens in the prequel stuff. So you see this possibility building, building through the franchise. So why wouldn't you have something that explores from the other side what it's like to be in a rebel with led by all these dudes and these male, predominantly male Jedi's? Mm -hmm. What's so there's a lot to explore here that could be interesting. And again, social commentary like she did with Handmaid's Tale. So I would love to see that. No, would you do a standard one? Great. Yes, do uh, do the Knights of the Old Republic. Do whatever. She's fantastic. She'd be great for those but i think something like this would also be fun i like that pitch yeah. i like that but you almost got to go picture from me I mean, <laughs> gotta go picture. Uh, but regardless it looks like kathleen kennedy you know they're looking obviously year or two they're they're way far into what they're working on uh beyond what we're just hearing about so it looks like they might be gathering some talent on paper to see who they might want to work with and that is exciting for star wars fans final question our final topic here in movie news going back to the last jedi you know Poor Ryan Johnson. He he's on the defense. <laughs> I get it. If you don't like the movie, you don't connect. That's fine. I I get it. But I love this guy. Consistently steps up and has answers. One of the big complaints, one of the big uh, criticisms was, well, Luke's force power. Where we haven't heard that before. Where's that in lore? That's not established. Ah, forget the fact that the, suddenly the Emperor in 1983 shot lightning. We all didn't question it then. <laughs> but well, uh, Ryan, you only can use force powers we're familiar with. Well, he took to Twitter and in a silent movie style here, Perry, with no words, pulled out the Legends book, The Jedi Path, which you can buy at a local bookstore along with the Sith book uh, and, and put them on your coffee table and, and never read them unless you're making a Star Wars film. He pulled it out <laughs> and one by one showed that in this book, the power of advanced force techniques, the doppelganger power is something that existed, yes, in Legends, but a lot of Legends, it's not like Legends don't count. It's just waiting over there, and it becomes canon or becomes uh, part of the story when they need it to be part of the story. They want it to be part of the story. So I love this. Then he closes off with the uh, famous Homer Simpson uh, melting back into the bushes <laughs> meme here. Uh, Barry, I, I, I always say this. You might not like his answers, but Ryan Johnson has answers. I think the biggest thing that I took away from this is that the Homer Simpson gif is hands down the most regularly useful, amazing gif ever. I just love it. It was a, really, it just ties into how he presented this whole argument here. Well, not really argument, but mm. you know, it was a playful way to address yeah. some of the concern. And if he if he does feel the need to engage and he's not required to engage, he and he should, I don't think that anybody could say that he 
can't either. Mm -hmm. He has the right to do that if he wants to. I think this is a, a fun, playful way to do it. But, yeah. you know, I, I do also understand that if, let's say, someone really didn't like this in the movie, sure. how they will view this response in a different way. And it's fair if they want to react that way. And it's fair for yeah. me to react the way I am. Mm -hmm. uh, digging into some of his other things, though, I mean, you know, Peter Serretta from... Uh, from Slash yeah. Film replied, and he's like, well, and he, he just explained, I think the way he put it was um, that that ability isn't well set up in the film, and then it's used prominently to resolve the climactic problem is a valid issue. And, you know, I, I do see his point that when you have an ability that's that key to mm -hmm. resolving the movie, that maybe you should have explained it a little more, but... I, I didn't, in that moment, yeah. I didn't feel, I was not aware that that passage existed anywhere in Star Wars books, canon, legend, whatever. I didn't feel the need to have that ability explained away to me. I, I got what I needed. I understand the the save the cat screenwriting kind of moment there, you know, like he explains, but like, and I'm not, I know you're not, I'm just for sake of conversation. How, how, and John, join mm. in, because you're great at understanding the force, sure. both in real life and in Star Wars. Um, how would how would you explain it? Because in my mind, when it happens and it fa you know you kind of figure something's going on, and then you see Luke back on the island concentrating. I literally went, "Oh, that's cool. He can do that," and watch the rest of the movie. Yeah. So, what more do you need? What more do you think could have worked? And I, I know this isn't I, your point, Perry, yeah. but, but maybe we can help explain. I want to hear the other side. How does that work? Well, listen. Look, he he subtweets. Uh, he didn't. He said, "I'm not trying to subtweet you, Peter," but. This and he showed the the end of Empire Strikes Back when Luke calls Leia when she's hanging off uh, Cloud City. I'm not gonna say that other place it's at, but he was hanging <laughs> off that and said calls Leia, <laughs> and people had never seen that before. Never seen it. But but he used it. Ryan yeah. did in this movie yeah. to have uh, a Kylo and a Rey connected in that way through possibly Snoke or some other way. In my, I think there's more to that than we're and we're gonna find out in nine. But I had no problem with it when this happened for Luke. Absolutely none because it made sense so much to me of the way because he had been studying the old Jedi books. Mm -hmm. That was all laid out to me. Brian did a great job of laying out Luke using this power. It's in canon. He has the old books. He's at the old temple. So he would have been studying for how many years sitting there? The fact that Yoda and him have a conversation about these books. So to me, it was all laid out that it was possible. The Leia Force power, that's my issue with the movie mm. because it comes out of nowhere. We didn't really see that much. And it is, if you read the books, obviously you, you know she is Force uh, sensitive and can do certain things with the Force. So that's fine if you read it. But if you're just a watcher of the movies, nothing hints you that she has this incredible command of the Force. So that I think that's more in contention than Luke being able to, to a visual, you know, transport himself or a visual image of himself over did, uh, did multiple Did you see his response universes. to that? No. Um, he, he wrote, because someone else asked him on I'm Twitter, sure. and his reply was was interesting. I guess the fact that she it, that she's in zero G and that space offers no resistance meant, in parentheses, to me, that it wasn't a big feat at all. Kind of mm -hmm. minimal, in fact. And, sure. you know, I, he as can much defend as I like the movie, yeah. I don't agree with that. Yes. Maybe it maybe it does make sense that if you have the ability to use the force and you're in zero G, you can move yourself around a little more mm -hmm. easily, but just relying on that reasoning wasn't enough to justify just the position and the way she looked. That's right. where my issue mm -hmm. lied with that the, example the, of the use of the force. The literal yeah. execution of what it looked like. Yeah. Exactly. I, I'm like the, the first couple, uh, the, the, the Leia Poppins thing pops up and, and I think the more you watch the movie, the less you have a problem with it. But I can't sure. deny the first time I saw it, I was like, okay, we're doing this weird look thing. But to me, it was just how it looked, not that yeah. she had the power. But That's you're true. saying, it's, again, not that yeah. Leia has the power, but that it was maybe came out of left field for the yes. general. Yes. Audience? For my opinion, for my opinion, I think it came out of left field. But but this kind of stuff, you know, do we want Star Wars to be revolutionary? If you want it to be revolutionary, you're gonna have to take the hits with the misses. And Ryan did mm -hmm. a lot more hits than misses in this movie. It deserves more credit than it's getting from some of the more traditional Star Wars fans. He took chances, and this he defended in canon. And Ryan trolls like nobody else. Ryan is trolling really well here on Twitter. The man knows what he's doing, and he's so he's showing you, hey, you may think you're, hey, maybe you didn't go back and read this part of the. So it shows you that he did he did a lot of effort, a lot of research a lot of study, understands this franchise and all the different things that are in canon and used it for his movie. And mm. that, he should be applauded for that rather than destroyed for that. And I love that he's showing it. The, the, all the tweets that lead to it, I love that. It's perfect. Yeah, and again, and again I, I, I guess... 
you know, the idea that, say, go to Force Awakens and Kylo stops that laser bo- bolt from Poe. Yeah. Like, that was the first time we've seen that. And I get to what you're saying about the, that tweet back to him about it's not the giant part of Force Awakens. So I understand that. And, it, and, it, and a lot of people had issues with Luke not being there. So I understand the big picture. I guess just the idea of I, you need to be explained what force, but we don't understand the force. Number one, it's a completely made up thing mm-hmm. right. by George Lucas. <laughs> so any, any rules you want, you can kind of toss in there with some kind of justification. I guess, Perry, that's where I'm coming down. Yeah, well, in this particular instance, I do feel as it's presented in the movie, it was enough for me to believe it yep. and feel satisfied with the ending. And I do fear that let's say they had stopped and explained where this ability came from, mm-hmm. where he found it in the book, how yeah. much he had to train to make that happen. I do fear that if you had explained it away, it might have wound up being less believable in the end because sometimes yeah. that does happen. Exactly. What do you need, like Billy Crystal's Miracle Max? Like, just take this pill and you're gonna right. you'll float and you'll be, you'll be there. Have fun storming the uh, first order, and ladies and gentlemen. When this when the force uh, of tapas is used, uh, don't think it's a Spanish savory dish. It's actually an <laughs> ability to remain warm in a cold environment. So Luke. <laughs> May have been able to save himself on Hoth, <laughs> Hoth without Han's help. So there's a lot of force powers that are yeah, that haven't yeah. been shown in the movie. So do your research before you complain to Ryan Johnson about stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you know, hey, it's, it's the internet. Just keep complaining. That's part of <laughs> part of why we created That's it, right, Al Gore? Too. All right, guys, that is it for Star Wars movie news. Let's move on to you know it. What's the deal with canon? This is where we discuss all things other. Star Wars news bites that relate to comic books, games, uh, TV shows, like our first story here, Star Wars Rebels. All right, this is like the 10th update, and this is the final one. This is why I personally do not like reporting on little scant rumors, because uh, then people take us as facts sometimes. Uh, Yes, the return of the second half and the final part of Star Wars Rebels' fourth season and the series itself. We've been waiting for the official date. We thought maybe last week it was uh, the 24th because of that Instagram from D. Bradley Baker. He later corrected that, uh, said he spoke too soon. Uh, We've got it now, February 19th, all right? Watching the Star Wars show on YouTube. With uh, Anthony and Andy over there doing their great work on the Star Wars cruise. The episode was shot on the ocean there. Uh, the the trailer came out, great poster came out, and the news that Ian McDiarmid himself is back as Emperor Sheev Palpatine Darth Sidious. We got to see a little bit of that in the trailer. So let's, uh, let's uh, for, with you two, we haven't really taken a deep dive into the trailer mm-hmm. Our thoughts. We we all watch Rebels. We're all excited for this end. We got a haircut from Kanan. Got a lot of things here, Perry. I agree. I don't like his haircut. <laughs> but Your I, hair I doesn't like, either. I appreciate appreciated that joke in the trailer. But after watching this trailer, I think it might be one of my favorite TV trailers yeah. I've ever seen. I just couldn't believe. Just you know, also because we're in the mid season, and normally my mindset is like, all right, get on with it. Just give me the episodes. I don't need another teaser or anything. Right. I thought that this was so well composed and in a way that just honors Ezra's entire journey throughout the season. Everybody who's out there Mm -hmm. following along with every step he took throughout this entire series that led to this big moment. Mm -hmm. There were so many, like, your voice has started something, something that's bigger than I ever imagined. And what that trailer did was basically just show you that. It showed you that (laughs) happening. And then it didn't just leave it there and then leave you with nothing to look forward to. Then it rolled into just a real, really appropriate use of new footage and Mm. little hints. And whether you're talking about the appearance of the emperor or another certain shot towards the end that I'm wondering about, there were just so many little things to press pause and wonder about where right now I feel like I'm not, I'm not harping on anything in particular. I'm just ready to roll right into it. And I like the teases that I've gotten. And now I'm just so hyped to be back with these characters again. Yeah, it looks like we're going to get, you know, a a mysterious ending. I can't right now predict where it's going. I definitely have thoughts, John. And the the shot of... Mortis, basically, yeah. connecting back to that great Clone, Ro- Clone Wars arc with the the father, the son, the daughter, that Convor, which I I, I believe at this point might be the daughter <laughs> from uh, you know again Rebels is kind of Dave Filoni's Clone Wars reclamation mm-hmm. project. A lot of things he didn't get to finish, a lot of things he didn't get to uh, dive into deeper. He has successfully brought into Rebels. We got some big fights, Thrawn, Rook, yeah. the the Siege of Lothal, all that stuff there. But this stuff with Mortis, there's some deep stuff, John. Yeah, there is, and I'm 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 just a bittersweet 
sweet watching this trailer, man. It mm -hmm. makes me emotional because it's been such a journey with Rebels, and yeah. you know, uh, to see it now coming to an end, it, it makes you think like, how fast is my life going? That it's already <laughs> the end of this series because I remember fighting for it when I was on Far Far Away, yeah, pushing people to see it at because people were dismissing it initially as a kid show because the first ten or so episodes were a bit kid friendly, sure. and so it made the switch. And when it made the switch, it was incredible. And the fact that they used that your voice is exactly when the switch was made when he got and sent the message out is exactly when that entire series changed so i love that they give a call out to that uh i'd love the kane and stuff i love that he's becoming stronger with the force he's using his powers uh, what new po force powers is going to show us that we haven't seen before and you're going to be like wait what and so th there's going to be a lot uh, there might be some of that but i think kanan is the thing here that makes me sad because mm -hmm. Masters die, and I have a feeling that this is what it's leading to. The, yeah. the haircut, the fact that he's not wearing the mask, and you can see his eyes now more. You see mm -hmm. that with Hera and him having that inter exchange there. I think that's what it's leading to. We know Hera survives. We know Chopper survives. We don't know what happens to anybody else. Uh, so this, and they and they, they tease an, a, a climactic ending. So what does yeah. that mean? And so uh, there's so much about it that they're exploring here and presenting to us that I couldn't be more excited to see what happens. Let's talk about the Emperor. I love yeah. that uh, McDermott is back. Uh, Whitwer does a great job with that voice, but anytime you can get the actual emperor to do the voice, uh, that's exciting. This has been rumored for a while. Mm -hmm. Some some rumors uh, being reported, like Star Wars News Net reported back in October. A lot of other sites did too, I'm sure. But uh, you know that's been floating around. I think I think there's also some work with the theme parks going on. I'm sure <laughs> Galaxy's Edge. But uh, this is this is exciting. But how does it factor in? I have been wondering that, and I think I'm wondering that more so for Thrawn's sake, mm. just because, I mean, I, I basically discovered Thrawn as a character right here on the show with you guys yeah. in that my first exposure to him was being at that Star Wars celebration when they announced All the right. book. Was and, that London? And it was in London, and everybody around me freaked out, and even though I didn't know why they were freaking out and why this character mm. was so special, there's something about being in a room like that and feeling that that energy that's just infectious and yeah. instantly made me want to meet this character, Thrawn, and I was a little underwhelmed by what mm. I saw yeah. in Rebels when he was in there, and then I read that book, and... I am just fascinated by that character's mindset, yeah. and I haven't really seen that come into play as strongly as I think it should in Rebels. So the inclusion of the Emperor, because mm -hmm. you don't get any, well, you could, I don't, I don't know. It depends what your favorite <laughs> villain is, but like the Emperor is one of the biggest, baddest yeah. Star Wars villains there is. So when you put him in the equation, I'm just curious to see more so than anything, because I think mm. it has to directly tie to Thrawn, what that winds up bringing oh, really? out of him. Yeah. There has to be some sort of connection there. Mm -hmm. that between Thrawn and the Emperor, or, Th or Emperor uh, Ezra, all of them? I'm, I'm thinking the Emperor and Thrawn. There, there's there's going... Uh, yeah, well, there's definitely, yeah. There's got to be something where... I'm not just talking about, oh, the fact that, you know, we're talking yeah, yeah, that, we're they, talking about the Empire versus, versus all of our heroes and yeah, yeah. that being their connection. S something where it brings something else out of Thrawn or gives Thrawn license to do something or okay. maybe teases the, the end of Thrawn. Like, he hasn't right. accomplished what he set out to do. Right, okay. I'm just curious what it means for Thrawn more so yeah. than, more, hey, more, look at this familiar character the, in the series And even now. more so than, say, Ezra, and I know they're in this picture together, yeah. or at least a hologram yeah. of the Emperor here. Palpatine, though, I mean, could this, this, this to me, has darker undertones with the Force, John, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we're talking Mortis, it's the, what, the physical manifestation of the Force, that planet, and so why wouldn't the Emperor appear? That could be Mortis that we're seeing there in the, mm. in the shots there. And also, who else uh, said that their favorite storyline occurs on more? Oh, it might be Ahsoka Tano. It might be Ashley Eckstein. Mm. So in yeah. Clone Wars, she said that's her favorite storyline in Clone yeah. Wars and when she was playing Ahsoka Tano. So I think we're not done with Ahsoka Tano. I don't, and I'm glad they kept her out of the trailer because if she shows up, people are going to be like, Bleh, Bleh. you know, and so I think it's going to be great. And she yeah. may help Ezra fight the Emperor or whatever is going to happen there. I love that he's got his uh, his white tiger creatures behind him chilling yeah, out, yeah, you know, that's such a great shot cat. of him. What's, what's that? The Loathcat. Yeah, the, the Loathcat. Lo with the his, both wolves, I should the say. The Loathcat with 
with his uh, green lightsaber. Such a great visual. You yeah, know? So great you know shot. there's going to be a confrontation here. So Paired the, with the dialogue in that moment, yes, too. It yeah. was just the perfect ending. Yeah. And it's a 90-minute season finale, so that's essentially a movie. Yeah, so on I'm, I'm March looking forward to it. 5th is yeah. the finale there. Oh, man, we're getting right to it here. It's a short little run, man. Night, February 19th to March 5th. We'll have all these uh, answers finally. Uh, this isn't uh, my theory at all. This has been going around the internet here for a couple weeks. The idea you have Ahsoka, Kanan, uh, Ezra kind of being a new father, son, oh, daughter yeah, type of thing. Yeah. What do you guys think about that? Sure. Would you be happy with them kind of whoo, going to that planet and being locked there forever, influencing the uh, the force going Damn. forward? That feels like a stretch to me because I've read some of that too and I understand what would make someone think mm -hmm. that, but it also feels like you're just, you're taking these characters and you're forcing them into those little boxes, which is why I'm not entirely buying it. Okay. I, I think that's fair. I, I think Kanan dies i'm with you john mm -hmm. but what do you think about this idea well if he doesn't die i like this idea because i do like that this would explain why we don't see them in a new hope or rogue yeah. one or anything like that it's because they're stuck on that planet and they're uh manifesting the force and doing what they can and the father son daughter is replaced by those three and it makes sense to me on so many levels and although it does feel a bit convenient to stop them progressing or not being sure. in these movies but it does work within the canon of star wars so i like the idea all right, well, the finale is on March 5th, Monday night. Then on March 6th, the Last Jedi novelization hits the stores. Jason Fry is writing this one, or probably, I'm sure, has completed it. And uh, some editors are correcting commas and periods right now. But the Star Wars show, our friends again over there at the Star Wars YouTube channel, uh, re, uh, they touched upon this novel. They had a great little piece on the show this week, revealing some of the deleted scenes, added scenes, new scenes into the novelization with Ryan Johnson's influence over these pair. He actually met with Jason Fry went over some of this stuff. Han Solo's funeral, the third missing lesson for Ray and Luke, which involves the caretakers, and I'm sure some other juicy little details. Not uncommon for a novelization, but a lot of focus and spotlight on it right now, Perry. Well, I don't care about those commas and periods because I'm just going to listen to the audio book. <laughs> surprise, ah. surprise. But I I'm excited to have a new Star Wars book to listen to. I've been on a Stephen King kick lately, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, it's nice to jump back and forth. But right. I really like what I saw in that little, uh, that little featurette that they put together. I don't know if this has been done before, but I did find it really interesting that uh, Ryan Johnson worked with the writer of the book to create new scenes for the book. Ha have other directors done that in the Not past? Not necessarily. And usually how these novelizations go is, you know, a writer gets, you know, Alan Dean Foster with The Force yeah. Awakens got like an earlier version of the script uh, for Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Uncar yeah. plot stuff, Poe and Ray meeting, a lot of that stuff was in there. Then it doesn't make it the final cut. And as the story group says, whatever's on screen is the final canon. So now... Poe and Ray didn't meet until The Last Jedi. We know that now, at least officially. They may have bumped each other in the hallway. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, as far as this, I know they delayed the release. Not de not delayed. Delayed the release of this novel. They just didn't want it to come out till after yeah. The Last Jedi, which made sense. Um, as someone who read the Phantom Menace, Menace novel like the same week the movie came out, you know. Um, Terry Brooks, great work. Um, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. This, this is interesting. Also shows Ryan Johnson's hands-on kind of approach to this story. Yeah, I, I appreciate that kind of approach. And, you know, that piece talked a little bit about how he's just really into the idea of a film novelization. And how he was excited to jump in there and work yeah. on these scenes with him and I think that means a lot, especially after that recent conversation we had about, right. you know, books and other canon material not being incorporated into the film franchise. And I know whatever is in the final films, not the novelization, is the official yeah. canon. But it is nice to have that connectivity there. And the stuff they're teasing, I'm dying to read. I mean, obviously, Han's funeral is a big one. But yeah. I really want to see a scene between Rose and Paige. Yes. I, it's, yeah. Even though they didn't have a scene together and all you really get is Rose talking about her sister yeah. that is such a powerful element of that movie and it takes up because you you spend so little time with Paige yeah but she has meaning and mm -hmm. value and it's like when I look at Rose I still see Paige and that's such a powerful right. element that I imagine these scenes are gonna have something really special to them it'd be yeah. interesting to see them together I know that there's a book the Cobalt Squadron which I haven't read which I think they're together in that but to have it in this kind of form uh, and and to tear into some of this stuff here mm -hmm. John ju juicy stuff mm -hmm. Han Solo's funeral yes 
You feel excited slash cheated? Or how do you feel about this being in a book versus no, the movie? I don't mind it being in a book. I mean, at least it's in some form of canon. I don't yeah. mind. Uh, so it's good to see what might happen during that funeral that we, we could have gotten. I mean, there's 20 minutes of deleted scenes. That's the rumor yeah. that might come on The Last Jedi when it gets released. So I'm excited for that. The small snippets they have in this YouTube video of yeah. this Star Wars cruise ship and Star Wars show, I'm excited about. So I was I, I yelled you, you at Ken. Want, you, you want to see caretakers dancing, I man. Do. I do. I don't care. Oh. I want to see caretakers dancing, but because the, the conversation that comes with it is pretty, yep. it looks like it's pretty intense and necessary. And we see Ray once again using that lightsaber yeah. in a way that she didn't get uh, to use until she got into that throne room. So yeah. it's nice to see that as well. So uh, to me, this just excites me that there's more here. And I think I echo Perry's sentiment. I like how, and this shows you when you watch this video, how involved Ryan Johnson yes. was. Whereas, like you said, Alan Dean Foster, it was a Q&A at a Comic-Con, <laughs> and he volunteered himself to write the, uh, the, yeah, to write yeah, the yeah, uh, novelization. Yeah, yeah. This is, looks to be completely different, and you see Ryan dictating, and you see him on the pad, John Fry on the pad, and that's great, because it shows you how in-depth. Once again, I think this speaks yeah. a lot to what uh, Ryan Johnson's fingerprints are going to be a lot of on Star Wars as we go forward, and people need to start accepting yeah, that. Yeah, I'm really curious to see what Jason Fry can, can do. He's written yep. some Star Wars stuff before you. Yeah, Alan Dean Foster uh, wrote the original New Hope novelization, yes. which again is is different, has other stuff as Luke's Blue 5. He went off an earlier draft. Mm. Don't forget the Re uh, Return of the Jedi. I almost said Revenge of the Jedi. The Return <laughs> of the Jedi novel states quite frank, uh, uh, quite clearly that uh, Obi-Wan's brother was Owen Lars. Uncle Owen was related mm. to Kenobi, and that's no longer true. So I think sometimes I get it, and and, and sh shows like this, you know, we push, we want to know canon, and I think that's important, but I think I'm just going to sit back and enjoy what's in this story enjoyed much like the the rogue one novelization snuck up on me i was like ah, i guess i'll read it and it really had some great extra stuff to make that story fill out a little bit more so i think that's what we're gonna get here with really this really enjoyed that one too i was yep. surprised by how much i enjoyed that it's really sadly good. there's no uh cobalt cobalt squadron audiobook so <laughs> well i can i can I'll john be, and i'll be I, taking the the mark you know, he's, on he's that a one. voice actor yeah <laughs> i'm an old radio dj we'll just read so it you guys can, we'll do a whole reading of yeah, it. We'll yeah. Do a read. we'll we do we should it. we should do a watch along with that <laughs> oh my god <laughs> you might have just created a whole kind of yeah. set of content right? oh my. <laughs> uh, final story in canon in star wars comics poe dameron issue 23 is out the mission to find lor santeca it's getting closer and closer it's heating up we got some uh, action here we got uh poe's x-wing stolen we got uh bb-8 uh you guys had a chance to take this in no no john <laughs> no no i did it's interesting <laughs> But I'm kind of not waiting for this Poe Dameron. The Poe Dameron comic line has been actually really good, and it's uh, there's been some weird things in it for sure, but that's kind of what you expect with comic books. It's, you're allowed to go a little weirder, but there's also been a lot of things as this races towards events of Force Awakens. You can start to see some of the connective thread in the story, the canon story, come together. So I do recommend Poe Dameron number 23. That is it for canon. Let's move on to your questions, your topics. Go to Twitter, go to Facebook. As I said up top, there is the Collider, Collider, Collider Jedi Council Facebook group. You can request to join. I take questions from there. I also take questions on Twitter using the hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Programming note, though, we usually record this Thursday afternoon. I've selected the questions by Wednesday. So if you're looking to get them in, Wednesday afternoon's a good time frame. Uh, not Thursday morning when I'm having coffee, talking to John about life. Uh, we don't, uh, we, we, I don't pull from them there. No. All right, because our good friend Ray Orr puts all these nice, nice graphics together the night before. Guys, first question. This is from the Facebook page. Gabe Holder asks a big question. I love it. With Ray now tasked with the survival of the Jedi, do you think she will adopt an older philosophy that we've previously been made aware of? i.e. emotion equals weakness, uh, attachment being forbid, all that stuff, or continue to tap into her aggression and other emotions, which he often does in battle, and rebuild the Jedi with a more balanced mindset. I think this is a great question. How could Rey rebuild the Jedi Order? Now, this isn't a question of whether we're going to see it in Episode Nine. I don't actually think we are. I think that might happen later on, even after the events of Nine. It could happen in between. I know Kylo, maybe if the Knights of Ren come back, we might have some Force users in there. Perry, John, I want to know here from you guys, how do you think she should approach it? How would you want Rey to approach a new era, a modern Jedi? Do you want big changes, John? I Yeah, I do. I do. I want big changes. I've been pushing for the Grey Jedi for quite some time. I think 
Ahsoka is the pioneer of this. I think you see, well, of course, if you go further back, you can see other uh, versions of the Grey Paladins, what have you. But like to me, the Grey Jedi is what I want to see now going forward. I think we as a people, as a society, as a viewing public right. have changed where we embrace anti-heroes. We, we like, kind of like the villains. We, you know, Vader's become a sweetheart. Now people love Vader now, you know, so there's a lot of changes. from I, when I, I blame Game of Thrones and Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's right, Stone Cold, that's right. And The Rock to a degree. Yeah. But, they, but you see that uh, happening in our society more and more. And I think that's the, the, the uh, uh, properties in the franchises have to reflect that. And I think with Rey, you have someone who embraced her force power very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. You have someone who uh, was schooling school, Skywalker yeah. through most of The Last Jedi. So this is not a conflicted person in the sense that you've seen before. Whereas Anakin was conflicted about the stuff with his mom and so he was driven by his rage. Luke is conflicted by, am I going to be good enough the whole time? He's conflicted by that. Rey is more about where's my place so that I can put this to further use. She's more intelligent in her approach to the Force. So I think there'll be more of a smarter approach, a more uh, a grounded approach, uh, and a more deeper approach to the Jedi she is going to train. And I kind of disagree with Ken a little bit. I think we will see a team of Jedi that Rey has trained in nine to go toe to toe with uh, the Knights of Ren. We've been teased the Knights of Ren for the last two installments. So I think it's possible there'll be that part of the battle when there is the final battle between the good, the dark and the light uh, at the end of nine. I'd be intrigued with that. I'll take the bet against that still, but mm -hmm. I like a Survivor Series battle here for yeah. Jedi for Jedi. <laughs> That's right. uh, quickly, and then Perry, uh, follow up with you though. Do you yep. think? Do you think she listened enough to Luke about what I think are some truths about the Jedi Order mm -hmm. back in the prequel era, back when Sidious took in power? I think yeah. Luke had some points and the failing oh, of that absolutely. institution. Do you still think she'll take some of that but combine it with, no, I am going all in on this good thing? Yeah, I think, I think she will. And I think the reason is because the greatest thing about these uh, uh, the characters we see in film are we don't like the characters that have it all figured out and just know what to do every single moment right. we like the characters that go on a struggle or conflict or make occasional mistakes and then bounce back from the mistakes to learn from them and be better as we all do as humans that's what makes us enjoy these characters and love these characters so much i think ray will have moments of hubris and she will have to learn from that but having those texts there's a reason she took those texts and right. she took those texts because she's going to explore and see what works and like anything else any smart person they take Take what works for them out of those texts and creates an order from it. And so that's what I see we're going to, well, that's what I think we're going to see from her. I like it. I like it. Perry, mm -hmm. going back to the core of the Jedi Order with those books there, what do you think? I'm going to lean towards how Roke is breaking it down. I'm agreeing <laughs> with you too much today. It's freaking me out a little. <laughs> no, I apologize but, for that. I think I should yeah. have thrown some more fire in this uh, here for you. Fair enough. <laughs> it's, it's about balance. We've heard the word balance over and over when we're talking about The Last Jedi and how everything is, is approached in that. But, you know, we also have that idea of legend. And I I have it in my mind because we were talking about that novelization thing and mm -hmm. we see in that clip that she she says i believed in your legend mm -hmm. and at the end of the last jedi we see the importance of right. legendary stories getting out there and reaching new people who might not have immediate access to what's going on with the force and the jedi and mm -hmm. the resistance so i think she's going to wind up finding the balance between the old and the new especially also because of the path kylo's on too to completely contradict that where he is kill the past, move on, get away from it. I don't think you can have one or the other. You need to bring right. it all together. And I think that's what Ray is all about, uniting everything that we've seen in this entire franchise. And, you know, the way you broke down what her version of the Jedi or whatever they wind up calling it winds up being, I would say just sustainability too, and mm -hmm. and yes. her ability to adapt. You know, um, the person who submitted this question also Gabe. also Gabe. Mm -hmm. Gabe also mentioned tap into her aggression, and I think that's probably one of her strongest things. I don't mean tapping into her aggression where she's fighting the urge to turn dark or anything right, right, like right. that. Tapping into her aggression in a way that as their enemy adapts and evolves, she's able to understand their mindset and adapt her organization mm -hmm. to be able to better fight that rather than fall victim to whatever they're cooking up next. Yeah, I, I mean, I've always liked, we. I think we like these Jedi, John, that push the boundaries. Yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi, mm -hmm. uh, Qui-Gon Jinn. Qui Jinn, yeah, We're absolutely. All, we, we like the idea of uh, more Qui-Gon. Mm -hmm. Yoda, was a, he was a teacher, but he also, you know, as we saw with Luke, he's like, hey, you, burn, you know, it's okay, man. Those books weren't weren't everything. And then uh, Quinlan Voss is one in, right. in Legends and Canon that's kind of a cult favorite because he you know he he danced with the dark side for mm -hmm. sure, especially if you've read the the novel Dark Disciple. So maybe it's it's about uh, like I love what Luke said in Last Jedi about do you feel the force? Feel the force. 
why do we think that belongs to us? There's some truth to that oh, there. Yeah. But just, Ray, understanding all of it means you're le maybe less tempted if you're familiar with, mm -hmm. you, with, with your emotions on the dark side. Yeah, I think there's a principled, principled nobility to Ray that we've mm -hmm. never seen from any character, I don't think, this side of Leia uh, in the Star Wars universe. And Leia at times can let her, has let her uh, uh, aggression put her into situations where she could be. Like, we still don't know what happened with that mind probe in, in New Hope. Yeah, we yeah. still don't know what happened between Vader and the mind probe in that room with Leia, how much torture she endured. So yeah. there are moments where we've seen her get herself into situations where she may possibly be in, been in overhead, but she gets out of it. Rey, I think, is the kind of person that will have the same kind of impetus herself. Mm -hmm. And that Journal of the Wills, is really, really important. They reference it in uh, uh, Rogue One. They, you see it possibly in The Last Jedi. This is important. There's a quote from there. First come the, comes the day, then comes the night after the darkness. Shines through the light. The difference, they say, is only made right by the resolving of gray through refined Jedi sight. That matters. Mm. Paraphrase, mm. The, find that phrase, put it up on your wall, because I guarantee you that's what Ray is, they're going to use to base Ray's new order on. I like that. What do you guys envision as going forward? A not perfect, because maybe that's part of it. You're not mm. perfect. Right. But what this Jedi, whether it's Ray or one of her peoples, what would they look like? Is like you said, Ahsoka. With, you know, she's got the the white blades as she rebled those blades right. back. Maybe a different situation, but she walked away from the Jedi Order, but maintained some of it. Kanan, mm -hmm. not officially a Jedi, really. What do you guys? What would you want? Ray and her disciples. What do they look like? What do they act like? It's an interesting question because, really, I mean, what they mean and what they stand for is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're when you're introducing a new form of a pre-existing thing mm -hmm. that people fell in love with and is so vital to the heart of these movies that's a, a challenging thing to bring to screen a new version of it where it doesn't feel like a carbon copy but rather pushes it forward and i do think that the look that they go with is going to be key to that <sighs> and i do think about ahsoka and her white blades because mm -hmm. that to me is a great way to be like here's this new thing that's you can see very clearly and very simply that it's different from the old and something new. So I think it's about putting some more like more subtle, not necessarily subtle because it's white versus any other color, but just smaller spins on it, especially, you know, like when you look at how Ray dresses even, there is something about the way that she looks that does make me think, oh, Jedi robes, sure. but it's also her own look and it's something different. So mm. I kind of want to see something that tips me off to thinking, oh, it's like that, but it isn't. And to be honest, it's going to be a hard balance to hit. It absolutely will. So go on, maybe go again, go back to the core, John, mm. but but different. Maybe maybe Jedi can date now. Maybe they can mm -hmm. swipe right yeah. in this future. Not that Ray needs or wants a love interest at this point in the story, but right. you know maybe that's part of the problem too. We talked about Leia. You talk about Leia. Mm -hmm. She decided to not train as a Jedi because it would have taken her away from her duties, uh, you know, helping the government of the galaxy. So mm -hmm. she chose to go that direction. Maybe there's a new way of looking at it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the Force is religion. Right, and if you're gonna break it down and be be philosophical about it, the force is religion. Religion at two deck two centuries ago is completely different than religion now. You change and adapt to the society, to the people. Why? Because that's how you attract new followers, but also that's how you make it relatable to what's going on in the world. Right. The conventional thought processes from the past don't work in the future most of the time. You have to adapt and improvise, and any religion does that in order to be successful, right? There's a huge push now to have female priests. Why is that? Because women are now being seen, finally, as equal all around. Enough with that crap from the old days. It's about time. So this is all a matter of this. You have to change and improvise as a religion. Yes, the basic tenets can stay the same, but the uh, practice can change. And I think that's what you see here with the force, and I'm all for it. Yeah, that's, uh, again, one of the connective threads going back to the prequels. I really believe George Lucas was trying to say something about that version of the Jedi Order. Be careful of the institutions that you trust, mm -hmm. even the good ones. Uh, and that's part of what Luke was addressing. But, uh, you know, when Kylo Ren says, kill the past, we locked onto that for this movie a little bit. Like, that was a the theme. But actually, I th that's that's kind of wrong. Kylo saying, kill the past. And I think Ray saying kind of learn from the past mm. as well. So she might take a lot of what was going on, a lot of Luke's failings, failings a great, uh, yes. failure's a great teacher, and put it all into a nice little force basket and we'll get some <laughs> new Jedis on the other side. We want to hear what you guys think the new Jedi Order should be. How should Rey go about rebuilding the Jedi Order? What do you want out of a new modern era Jedi? Use the hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Go to the Facebook page and we will uh, take your, uh, your versions of it there. Let's uh, move on here. A couple more left in the day here 
Luke Collins asks this uh, great question at Lat Collins 1978. Do you think the Millennium Falcon will or should die in episode nine? Uh, this is a question I, I see a lot, and I love getting different responses, even if we've discussed it in passing here before. <laughs> I, I, I want your your guys' take on this ship. You're Star Trek guy, Roca. <laughs> that Enterprise. That Enterprise. It goes down all the time. It goes all, but every time it goes down, it is like a character dying. You can't deny the Falcon's a character. Right. Do you want to see it die in nine? That it will die. It, it, it let, will die. let the past die. That bucket of bolts is going down, unfortunately, but we retired. But that's why you do a solo Star Wars story. So you have it have new life from the beginning in the solo Star Wars story. And who knows if that thing turns out to be a surprise hit. I would not be surprised to see sequels from that. So the Falcon will still live on in the solo uh, 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 offshoots, but not necessarily in the trilogies anymore. I think we're done with all the old stuff from the original trilogy. I think all that's going to die by the time nine is finished. Fair enough. I lean towards a no. If the question <laughs> is posed, what do I want? Something mm -hmm. about killing the Millennium Falcon after we've lost iconic characters in the past two installments feels like almost like a cheap play. It's like, we got to kill something now. Might yeah. as well do that. But I also think there is a scenario where maybe it could go down and then be repurposed into something new. Sure. And mm. if that's how it plays out, at least that would have new meaning to it. So like in episode 10, it's like Ray's apartment. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Yeah, Ray's okay. caravan. A oh, kitchen like, was at it. Like Remember they got some place to live? Yeah, more, <laughs> more living uh, facilities in the, in the Falcon now there. All right. Uh, yeah. You know, as far as my answer, I would hate to see it go down. I think I would be emotional. I just like, like I was emotional when we first seen The Force Awakens. I think I reacted more to that than all, some of the other characters because I'd already seen, you know, we knew the Falcon was in it, but we, we saw the Chewie I'm home moment, so it was a little less effective in the movie, but I, I think they needed it for the trailer for Force Awakens. But when, you know, all right, we'll take the garbage, and you pan over, it's like, get the Falcon. <laughs> so I get it. I don't necessarily necessarily want it to die, and plus I'm still collecting Falcon Lego sets. Like, I want some <laughs> new ones going forward. I already have a, a new one for the solo story. All right. All right, couple more questions here. Uh, this is, where did that one go? Coming from Ed Crandall. Ed underscore Crandall says, Hey, Collider Jedi Council, I'm old enough to know that The Empire Strikes Back wasn't initially received as well as everyone's uh, nostalgic rose-colored glasses. Remember, it wasn't until after Return of the Jedi. Do you think The Last Jedi will be better appreciated in the context of the completed sequel trilogy? I, this is the time uh, either heals all wounds or time gives you perspective. At the end of each Game of Thrones season, I always kind of wait. Because on one hand, I'm like, that was great. other hand, let me see what fits in. I didn't like season two of Game of Thrones as much right after that season ended. Now it's actually maybe my favorite season, mm -hmm. John. So let's apply that to Star Wars, The Last Jedi. I know there's backlash, but mm -hmm. will time kind of change people's view on this? You're I, nodding yes. Uh, yes, I think so. I think it's... Uh, a little bit ahead of its time for some of the people watching it, some of the traditionalists. And we'll see how Nine wraps everything up. If Nine wraps everything up in a way that kind of organically feels correct, that they are that the, everything they laid out in Eight gets wrapped up a little bit in Nine, organically correct, I think people will revere it. I think people will enjoy it. I think Ryan, in the long run, will get more credit for having changed the Star Wars universe in a way that was more accessible to more people. And uh, I, I certainly think it'll be. And if you remove that canto, do what I do. When I go see it, I go to the bathroom during Canto <laughs> Bite, and I come back, no. and you know what? The film is fantastic. I like, but I, this is, this is yeah, my version. I know, I know some people like Canto, version. but this is my version. I've seen it four times now. Yeah. Every single time uh, since the first time, I go to the bathroom during Canto Bite or walk around the theater for a couple minutes, come back in, Canto Bite's over, and I'm yeah. ready to go. You're doing calisthenics in the hallway yeah, where you're stretching doing, out, doing yeah, squats yeah. and everything there? <laughs> Perry. Well, I every time I go see it and see the Canto Bite stuff again, I grow to appreciate it more. Mm. I don't ever go to, grow to appreciate the execution because I still think that was way subpar compared to everything yep. else in the film. Yeah. But I appreciate the meaning of what happens there for the characters and also for the world overall with this question, though. So I do think that single installments of a movie need to be satisfying all on their own, and they also need to be satisfying on a first watch. But there is also no doubt in my mind that at least for me, every time I've seen Last Jedi, it gets more and more powerful, and I find new little details that bring new meaning to the story. Then you also have to consider the fact that it needs to stand on its own, but when it's part of a series and a trilogy, one installment should serve the other. So I think if Episode 9 finishes so, so strong and in a way that makes you look back at the events of this film and see new meaning, more meaning to it, 
that then this could pan out mm -hmm. this way but it's difficult to predict when i have no clue what episode nine is really going to be about <laughs> and if it's going to be a great film right and and like you said you might look back at eight and go we needed eight to be that way for what's going on in nine mm -hmm. time does change it yeah you know i was i was four when empire strikes back came out so i had no backlash to it uh but but jedi was one that for me changed mark ellis loves return of the jedi i know a lot of people my friend jennifer landa jedi's her favorite mm. um but over time that changed for me where i love the throne room stuff but other stuff it's great action and i'm not even talking i'm not talking bad about the ewoks but it's just empire i grew to appreciate empire more and what it did to the story that's just naturally going to happen i think the backlash right now it, it we are in a time where backlash is amplified john yeah. roken just yeah. because of all the devices we have access mm -hmm. to yeah absolutely back in the day uh, you know I, I was watching some gene siskel's review of return of the jedi yeah. he liked it but it was just he was talking about you know a star wars needed to change they they had some criticism for only having one female character and it, so mm -hmm. some of the same stuff is was going on back then we do have a sense to putting on those glasses um but i, I think think over time this one will fit into the story yeah right? there's, a, there's a great meme on facebook of uh, someone uh, playfully reviewing empire strikes back with today's eyes yeah and just destroying it and you go yeah that could have happened back then if we were as fervent and as in love with these franchises right. as we are now where every little thing gets hyper analyzed because we've attached so much personal involvement and look i'm not bashing that you can backlash all you want it's a free country a free world your right to backlash do as you wish i'm saying you got to look at it in empire uh, the same thing would have applied to empire strikes back so don't think these nostalgia films are so much better than these films because they didn't receive the same kind of backlash we didn't have that ability back then and you might be surprised how we would have backlashed against uh, empire strikes yeah back. we did have that ability it was called the playground yeah right you, exactly. know? <laughs> you want to go out of recess and and talk bad about return of the jedi right. let's there do also it there. wasn't the ability to analyze quite like we can yes. now yeah. where you can own a digital copy of a movie and actually go frame by frame yeah, and then yeah. research god knows how much backstory before you actually make an assessment on something absolutely absolutely thankfully we have this industry now the nerds took over and here we are <laughs> breaking everything down all right final question i swear cody final question from matthew gibson on facebook is there any chance ray and kylo exist in harmony together or apart as one representing light and the other representing dark maybe talking about true balance john at the end end of nine do we need one of them to go do we need one of them to be redeemed or one to go to the dark side could they just go their separate ways in a way i need cody to create a roca hot take this is what i need him to create for the moments like oh, this no. this is what i'll tell you right now uh kylo ren will not die at the end of nine he will persist on forward i don't think they will reach harmony there will be no redemption for kylo mm. but the possibility may exist I guess I misspoke. It possibly may exist that there will be harmony, for lack of a better term. Ray will survive. Ray will have her order, and then Kylo will have his order. Does this mean they'll come back later on in another film, maybe down the road in Ryan Johnson's trilogy? I don't know. But I would be incredibly surprised if Kylo Ren dies at the end of Nine. I think you don't create a character like that. Give him a journey like they've given him, an intimate journey, and made him almost... Uh, likable in the second film, which was incredible considering what happened in the first film, uh, and then just kill him off or easily redeem him, which everyone's been predicting, right? If you're gonna mm. not, if you're not gonna make Rey a Skywalker, don't give me the same redemption story you gave Anakin. Don't. It's supposed to be new and conventional and different. So don't give me the same story beats if you're not gonna follow it with other characters. That's a Roka hot pick. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be way more controversial. Uh, yeah, no, than I, that. It was, I, was I, I, I get behind that. I get well, Perry. All right, I yeah, I've been thinking about this question ever since you sent it out last night, and I've been stressing about it because it. Given what happens in Last Jedi, I really do think that at this point, you cannot redeem that character. Yep. They made a very clear decision right. in Last Jedi, and to backtrack on that feels like a cheap, like nice, neat little bow at the end. That can't happen. Mm -hmm. But also, I don't see I don't see them existing in harmony. I think you could take mm -hmm. the word harmony out no matter what way you look at it, but I have a hard time thinking that I'm gonna be satisfied if episode nine ends simply with Rey killing Kylo. They have to do something fresh and new with that, and they, they obviously can't retrace what they've done in past films with characters dying. But obviously, if she captures him and they lock him away, it's stupid. The only thing that I'm kind of liking in my mind is maybe Kylo just going off and being in wild space and existing somewhere else. You know, I, I do think they're going to come up with mm -hmm. some sort of genius conclusion that 
feels like a satisfying ending, but also something different and unique that we haven't experienced in the past. But this is why I'm not a, a screenwriter. <laughs> I'm not the one coming up with it. So I'm curious to see how they do wrap this up for them. I think they're going to go with the Harry Met Sally ending. We fade out, fade up on a couch, <laughs> Kylo and Ray. And then three months later, we got married and we had a coconut cake, a coconut cake with chocolate sauce on the side. As long, I think that as long might as be he's shirtless, As long as he's shirtless, <laughs> oh, I'm down. <laughs> right, Look, I, I think there is an, I definitely a place where we could find some kind of balance that would be somewhat different. I think you're right. I've wrestled with the Kylo Redemption story myself. I'm okay with it on one day. The next day, I'm not. One of the reasons I'm not okay with the Kylo Redemption is because how it ties into the end of the Leia story. Leia believed her son was unsavable, could not be saved. And Luke was like, yeah, you're right. I'm not here to save him either. I think to redeem Kylo could kind of take that a little bit away from the ending of, of Leia's story. But the great conversation for another day. We've got a lot to wait. A lot of time to wait until episode nine. Can I ask you one last question? Yeah, yeah. All right, Ky real quick. I know we got to go. Kylo Ren, is he doing what Ray is doing? Is he changing the way the Sith, the darkness, the dark side of the Force is going to be administered? The way Ray is changing the way the Jedi is, Jedi is going to be administered. I, I think that's, isn't that certainly possible? I think it's a great question because you know he's killed his master. Yeah, and survived. And he has a and, different and, approach to and it. Is not necessarily yet. Maybe in nine he has an apprentice, but mm -hmm. if he and, and I know he's not Sith. We, right, we, we, right. We're, but that's why I love the Snoke being cut in half yeah, angle. Yeah. It's something we haven't really seen before on the big screen. So you're right. It. Maybe he could be redefining it as well. Mm -hmm. So that was it for the day. We have had a lot of fun talking about how Ray could possibly rebuild the Jedi Order. I want to thank Perry Nemiroff, the Grand Moff Nemiroff. Thank you for having me. This is always such a treat. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Roka Fett. You guys can always find me at the Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. The Top 10 Show. We just did Top 10 Paul Newman movies. Go take a look at that. He should have been in a Star Wars film, I think. And you can follow me at Ken Knapsack. Also, I'm finally on Twitch at Ken Knapsack. You can find me there working some stuff out. But if you want to talk Star Wars with me while I play Pew Pew Pew, I'm on there as well. <laughs> we'll see you. That's it, guys. We'll see you next week. May the Force be with you. Always. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.